We are entering into a new series today called Solomon's Song, Sex, Love, and Good News. Over the last several uh, days, I've had you know, many parents writing, is this going to be safe for my kids because we're all in the same room today? I'm like, yes. And, and here's the, the, the thing when it comes to these kinds of conversations. Scripture is powerful, all of it. It's shaping. We'll talk about this in a minute. Um, we're not going to engage this series in a, uh, an untimely graphical way. That's not the essence of Solomon's song. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. As we go through today's message, it's going to be a little bit different in terms of its content. We're going to kind of set the series up because there's some things that we have to do. If you find this morning's message of interest to you, and I mean like kind of sparks like, ooh, let me think about God's word this way. On September 21st, we're starting a new Wednesday night uh, Bible study here in the worship center. I'm going to lead called Thy Word, getting the most from the Bible. And some of what we're going to engage in that series, we're going to actually do today because it's important for us to enter into Solomon's song. So let's look at this together. As we introduce Solomon's song, there's a few things we need to pay attention to about this particular text as we look at it, right? So Solomon's song is drama. If we were to peel back the different kinds of scripture, and, and there are different kinds of scripture in the Bible, right? You have gospels, you have epistles, you have um, apocalyptic literature, which always sounds scarier than it means, but apocalypse just means revelation. So when people say this is an apocalyptic uh, thunderstorm or whatever, it doesn't really make sense because the word just means to be revealed. But we've made it like this end times kind of tension piece. Uh, there's poetry, there's history, there's law and code. And, and Solomon's song is drama. If we were to approach Solomon's song as a, an early century or even contemporary Jew, we would identify this song as being wisdom literature. In the Jewish dynamic, they had Torah, which are the five books of Moses. They had the histories, Kings, Chronicles, Samuel, Esther, Nehemiah. They had the prophets, major and minor prophets. And then they had wisdom literature, which is often presented in a poetic way, like the Psalms, uh, Ecclesiastes. Proverbs, Job, Song of Solomon is in that group of texts. And when we look at it, the way it unfolds uniquely among the wisdom literature is it's a drama. It reads like an early century B.C. stage play. And you have to read it that way to really understand what's being unfolded in the course of the text. You can get lost in the text if you don't. But it's a drama. And when we look at it, it actually plots out. This is kind of fun. I'm an English major and mythology student by uh, my bachelor's degree. You get nothing, by the way. Like, I have a bachelor's with a focus in mythology and a minor in world philosophy. That is not a money-making degree, kids. Um, there are far more lucrative degrees that you can study. But I wanted to uh, really unfold the impact of what the world believed. And what does that look like when it comes to the gospel? And so you can actually track through uh, Solomon's song from beginning to end with a narrative arc that is so beautiful. It begins with an exposition. Um, love story begins in chapter 1, and they, they start talking about things. And then the groom invites his love to a spring day. Let's go hang out before we get married. And then the, the rising action starts to happen. There's a night of separation that causes so much anxiety. Anybody ever have to live through a long-distance relationship? Cause you any anxiety? That's what you see in the rising action. And then the biggest part of that, uh, this story is the wedding night and the wedding day. And we get chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5 dedicated to the wedding celebration. And then the action begins to resolve. As we get into the later parts of the book, there's another night of separation. But instead of being anxious about life, the bride is comforted 
She's secure in her relationship with her new groom. And then she invites him to enjoy a spring day after the wedding. And then true love story wraps up. As we may say with fairy tales, they lived happily ever after, right? But it follows this beautiful, dramatic arc. And when we start to pay attention to what that does and how that unfolds, when we, when we read Scripture, like sometimes we approach the Bible and we want to read it in a way that we want to get something out of it. And so we're digging and digging and digging just to kind of find that little nugget of something. Almost like gold miners in California who would pan rivers and just kind of shake stuff, hoping for some spark of something gold. Recently, we were in Alaska, in Juneau, Alaska, and we got to walk through some of these old mining places and see kind of different pieces of where the gold rush in Alaska was happening. And we found something sparkly, shiny in the river. It was so cool. So dad goes down into the river and he picks up a few pieces Now, what we found was a nugget of something, but that nugget outside of my rock collection is worthless because we would call it fool's gold. And sometimes when we dig into Scripture in a way that doesn't allow us to see Scripture as God put it together, we start making stuff up about the Bible. We start telling the Bible what it's supposed to say rather than the Bible telling us what it already says. And so when we engage Scripture in in the form that it's put, like this particular piece being written as drama and reading it as drama doesn't make it less true. You ever watched a movie that speaks a lot of truth about the world? Doesn't make the truth untrue because it's presented in dramatic form. Truth is truth is truth. Recently, Corey had a a day procedure, and as she was coming out of her anesthesia, she said to the doctor, did you know a duck is a duck is a duck? (laughs) That's good wisdom. A duck is a duck is a duck. Truth is truth is truth, no matter what form it comes to us in. It's not my truth. It's not your truth. All truth is God's truth, because he is truth. And we can pay attention to things that are true, even if the form is dramatic. And paying attention to that form is significant. It helps us actually understand it better. And because it's drama and true, there's also characters in that drama. So the the voices that we see over the next several weeks as we engage the text, the voices that we see, we can say that God is a character in the Song of Solomon because he gave us all the truth. The Spirit is the one who breathes these words. But in the text, in dramatic form, we have a woman, we have a man, or a bride and a groom. They're the ones who are going to be married together. There's a narrator who kind of speaks over the story. There are brothers that are addressed and will share wisdom. And then there's young women, sometimes as a group, sometimes as an individual. But there's young women that the bride is sharing thoughts with, and they're going back and forth. And those those dramatic pieces are significant for us to pay attention to as we go into the text. When we think about this, Solomon's song is also wisdom. It's in that wisdom framework. When we think about the layout of the Old Testament, the law, the Torah, the first five books of Moses, the Torah gives us the foundation for life with Christ. When we think about the the Bible that Jesus read, all of what we call the Old Testament was Jesus' Bible. That's profound. The words that he gave and the words that he taught and the words that he lived by as example, that's what we call the Old Testament. They are valuable, deeply valuable. And Torah, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they lay out for us the foundation of life with God. The histories and the prophets remind us of being prepared for life with God and how that unfolds. But the wisdom literature uniquely unfolds the depth of desire for life with God. And that's what we see in Solomon's song as we approach it with 
the dynamic of it being a wisdom text. Nowhere in Solomon's song is God's name mentioned. And yet we see more often than not this phrase of my beloved. And when we begin to understand Solomon's song in relationship to desiring God and relationship with him, we understand that he is our beloved and we are his. And it's a powerful connection. Solomon's song, we think about it according to the ancient rabbis, and we can track their, their thoughts about the Hebrew scriptures. We can track what, what, they, what they would lean into. Next to the Torah, those initial books of Moses, Solomon's song was considered the holiest of all sacred writings because of how it unfolded desire. And not just some earthly desire, but a desire for relationship with the one who loves you most. And that's who God is. God is the one who made you, who shaped you, who loves you most. And over the next several weeks, as we go through this book together, my prayer as we we enter into this text together is that we will detangle Solomon's song and find within us a desire for the one who loves us most and deepen in that desire. Now, there may be pieces of this sermon series that will strengthen marriages, help us detangle some things about human sexuality, but ultimately, that each of us, whether we've believed for decades or we're brand new to faith or we're still searching for life with God, that we would find a desire for the one who loves us most. And that would be what unfolds through this text. When we think about what Solomon's song does, it has become historically entangled and it's lost much of its early reverence. Like if we start to watch like the, the proclamation of Solomon's song in contemporary Christianity, like where we live today, it's finding a bit more um, popularity for people to go through. But there was a season starting after the time of Constantine. Let's take some history here for a minute. So the early church begins. After the time of Jesus, the Holy Spirit descends the book of Acts. Paul's writings happen The church begins to grow and expand, mostly because of persecution. Scattering the church everywhere. But those who were persecuted so deeply loved Jesus and believed that good news, they told everyone about it. And the church began to grow. Under Constantine and Rome, the church kind of becomes a national religion, and it grows. And that's kind of where we see this idea of the Catholic church come from. Catholic meant this one unified church for a season. Once Christianity came into medieval Europe, though, we get to these medieval times, something happens. Would you believe that men wanted to be in control of everything? (laughs) The men squirm and the women laugh. (laughs) About the time of the medieval ages, the patriarchy that was leading the, the, the national perspective, both kings and priests, if you would, they begin to look at Solomon's song. They begin to defame the song. The primary reason for defaming the song is that the primary voice of the drama is a woman. How can a woman lead Scripture? And so they begin to, to distance themselves from Solomon's song because of this strong, faithful woman's voice. So then she became not just a strong woman, but she became a lustful woman. And you can find in the medieval writings these tensions with Solomon's song and this lustful woman. And then it became a book that wasn't permitted to be read because it bothered the brothers. It stirred in them feelings that were too natural. And it was a lustful book. If we track scripture, lust is a tension of sin. And you have to ask yourself, you have to ask yourself, would God who is only good put something in his word that isn't good for you? Somebody say no. Thank you. 
God who's only good would not put something in his word that is not good for you. God who is only good and righteous and loving and true only does what is good and loving and righteous and true. And his word is only going to unfold that. But, but we took that word, humans did, and we tangled it up and we put it in a box and we kind of put it aside. And as Solomon's song got tangled up with, with this dynamic of lust and desire, we missed the greatest love story ever told, that is God loves you. And now we have to unpack that. We have to detangle Solomon's song. I, I love to fish. I don't know if you know that or not, but it's something that I grew up doing as a kid, like living on the farm. We had ponds, and we could go fish. We lived not far from a lake where the farm was. We could go fish. One of the worst things that can happen as a fisherman is your line gets tangled. I don't know if you've ever had to go grab, like, fishing gear after a road trip, and we try to get out, to, and everything's kind of tangled. It's like Solomon's song. It's all tangled up. And what we have to do, like with, with anything with Scripture, is we have to start to detangle it because that entanglement is no good for anybody. And the way of Scripture, the way that it goes, if God's Word is good for us, we have to pay attention to it. We have to untangle it because the world has such a deep grip, not only, not only on what we see and how we do God's Word, but on us. Like, have you thought about this for a minute? Like, if the Bible says that, that we are all... Um, victims, if you would, of the brokenness caused by sin. And sometimes I, I like to think about this in really cool ways. Like, I love watermelon. Tomorrow is a picnic with our family, and we're going to have watermelon with our picnic. It's a great thing to celebrate. In the I used to farm watermelons. It's one of my favorite things to eat. But do you know I have never eaten a watermelon that wasn't tangled by sin? I've shared that before. Like, the Scripture says that all of creation has been marked by sin. I like sinful watermelon. Can you imagine what watermelon in heaven is going to taste like? Holy cow. Like as good as it is here with taste buds that can't possibly think beyond sin and relate beyond sin, with a fruit that is marked by sin, and I still like it? Like, I can understand if you said Brussels sprouts are of the devil. <laughs> you know, I hear that at my table often. I like Brussels sprouts personally. But now think up here. As good as God is in the redeeming of our minds, my mind is still broken. My mind still fights the tension of sin, and so does yours. And so the entanglement of Solomon's song is there for all of us. So how do we detangle this, and how do we see what's good and true? And this is true of all of Scripture. How do we detangle it from, from the world around us that, that we can get from the Scripture as God intended, these places of equipping and empowering for our daily lives, to know Him and to be loved by Him? How do we detangle it to find it good? 2 Timothy reminds us, that all of Scripture, all of Scripture is breathed by God. Paul had no word for this in the Greek language, so he made up a word. I like that about him. Theos panustos. It's a very confusing sounding word, but it means breathed by God. It's God's breath. I mean, think back to Genesis chapter 2 where out of the dust God formed a man and he breathed life into him. That's Scripture. It is life. It is God's breath into us. And all of Scripture is breathed by God. It's profitable for us. It corrects us. It teaches us. It leads us into all of life to be perfectly equipped for every good work, to be complete. Scripture leads us to wholeness. That's the power of God's Word. And Solomon's song is right there in that mix. So how do we detangle it? We have to separate what's Earthy from what's worldly. And this is huge. This is a, a, a significant comparison here. If we think about this dynamic, like when we look at Scripture, we, we enter into the biblical world when we open it. There was at a time a particular audience that has, has now moved into us in our contemporary lives, but we see culture, we see history, we see a world that we enter into and we enter into that biblical world, 
And then we have to detangle the earthy from the worldly to find this beautiful cosmic truth and this cosmic goodness that's there for us. And I say cosmic because God is the one who held everything and holds everything together. Things that are earthy are what's intended by the Creator. And if you read through Scripture, there are only three chapters in all of the Bible that don't deal with the impact of sin on the world. Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Revelation 22. Sin is dealt with. No sin in the world, Genesis 1 and 2. Sin has been judged. And now there's this beautiful, eternal walk in Revelation 22. Everything else has the impact of sin. Death, judgment, sacrifice. Confusion, distortion. But there is a world that God made. And when he made that world, he called it good. Like, this is Labor Day weekend. Like, let's mark a time stamp for those of you watching online. This is Labor Day weekend. In Genesis 1, God made work and called it good. By the end of creation, the beginning of Genesis 2, God also made rest and called it good. Both can be celebrated this weekend. That there is work, there is labor, and there is rest. There is labor day. And it's good. That's earthy. God made man, God made woman. Earthy. They're good. Co-equal in the image of God that they share together. Different from one another, not the same. And everything that happens between man and woman, God intended. Earthy. There was pleasure, and there was procreation, all part of the sexual nature of man and woman, to enjoy each other, to have children, to be family. By Genesis 3, the world is broken. Interestingly enough, not a surprise to God, Scripture says that Jesus is the Lamb who was slain before the foundations of the earth. We can challenge God with why he would let this happen, why didn't he just robot us? Why didn't he just zap Adam and Eve? I, I don't know. I'm not God. It's not my place. My place is to enter into relationship with him, to know him and be loved by him. And in the process of that, I have to be aware that the world and everything in it is marked by the weight of sin. And I have to detangle that so that I can live into my life today with God and others and that's huge for all of Scripture. It's part of our trusting of God's Spirit in us. It's part of the need of relationship with other believers. Like, popular opinion aside, I don't know everything. And by popular opinion, I mean what I think about myself sometimes. Or at least what I've been accused of by my kids sometimes. Dad, you don't know everything. Are you sure about that? Well, so long as you can create a little bit of doubt there, they never know that you don't know everything, right? But all of this is marked by sin. Thank God we're being renewed by grace, right? But in the process of that, we have to detangle, including ourselves, so that we can enter into this truth that God has for us. And sex, love, and good news get entangled, just like everything else. So when we start to approach it, what do we do? I love Augustine of Hippo. Augustine wrote this volume called Confessions. Augustine is one of those, those early church uh, writers and thinkers who, who shifted and changed. Like, like everybody in the world of Christianity historically loves Augustine. The Catholics love Augustine. The Lutherans love Augustine. The Baptists love Augustine. Everybody loves Augustine. Everybody's got some kind of connection to Augustine. Now, for their own purposes, sure, I'm sure, but he writes this book called Confessions, and he's pretty open about his life. Augustine struggled with lust. He liked women. And, and not to great detail, he does talk about his struggles with lust throughout Confessions. And then he talks about the day he met Jesus. The day that the truth of God came alive in his soul. And he concludes in that dynamic of confessions that his soul 
would never find rest until it found itself in Christ. What a beautiful confession. I I think there is no human statement that better lines up with the, the aim of Solomon's song than Augustine's confession. The invitation of the song is to find rest in the one who loves you most. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. What a beautiful statement that the song sings to us. When we we get tangled up in the worldly of things, we settle for worldly desire, we see lust become self-medicating. Like whatever that desire may be, whether it's a material lust or a sexual lust, like whatever that is, when I start to pursue lust as the way for my soul to be satisfied, I start to self-medicate. One of the things we know about self-medication is it is dangerous. Absolutely dangerous. You know, in the morning time when you wake up, that thing that first shoots dopamine into your brain will drive you all day long. So like if you have like a sugar thing, and some of us have sugar things, I get it. But like if you eat pancakes and syrup first thing in the morning, I'm not condemning pancakes and syrup, by the way. But once that carby goodness with all that melty butter and that sweet maple syrup, or the fake stuff if you like it, whatever. Once it hits your tongue and your brain fires and goes, whoo, sugar time. For the rest of the day, you will want sweets. If you wake up in the morning and the first thing that you do is you hit this thing to find out how many likes and posts and friends you have. Whoa, I have a new friend. Bing. For the rest of the day, I will be drawn to this device. Whatever first hits my brain to satisfy it temporarily will mark me for the day. My soul will never find rest until it finds rest in you, O Lord. And so we we go through that. When we we fall into these worldly pleasures, we start to lead into that. When we start to self-medicate, we fall into traps that keep us from experiencing the truest of loves. C.S. Lewis says that, that it's not that we, we, we don't pursue who God is, but we often settle for base desires. Rather than pursuing this, this deepest and truest of love that, that Solomon's song is going to reveal to us, we, we pursue lesser things. As much as I like to fish, fishing will never satisfy my soul. Whatever it is, you can fill in the blank with. It is not going to sustain your soul. Only the one who made you can do that. And he's inviting you to experience the truest of loves. The true love of Christ is where we belong. We were made for it. You were made to be loved by God. Think about that for a minute. Your chief purpose in life is not to be an engineer, a banker, a mom, a dad, your chief purpose in life is to be loved by God. Wow. I was made for that. The one who spun, I, I, I remember the first time, I, I'm an astronomy geek, I remember the first time I saw Jupiter through a telescope, and the moons of Jupiter were like an equal number stretched out across both sides of the planet. And you're looking through this, and you see it all in monochrome because it's all like the lens black and white, whatever. But it's so amazing. You can see the spot, and you can see the bands, and you can see everything. And the God who put that in place made me to be loved by him. Not to earn love, not to fight for love, not for anything else, but simply to be loved by him. And I have to detangle my soul from everything else that says otherwise. And that's the emphasis of Solomon's song, that we can find ourselves in the truest of loves. I don't know where you are today. I don't know online or in this room where your soul falls, what has tangled you, what has trapped you, what has tempted you. But on this journey of love, may we find ourselves completely free detangled that we could be loved 
by the one who loves us most.